All righty. Good morning, everybody. Um, great to see you. Karen Schaefer here, chair of CMAL, and we are at our 61st annual convention. And so I welcome you to that. Um, so what we'll do, we have our, we have a, a great keynote speaker this morning. We are really fortunate to have somebody um, from our own league family who is an expert. And then it's, what we'll do is we'll invite Gretchen to give her remarks. She even has a PowerPoint. This is extremely impressive. Um, and also um, we'll you know, give a record of her remarks for anybody's future um, reference. And and Gretchen will be taking questions and um, we can put them, if you want to put them in the chat, you could do that. And if you would like to ask them, maybe you could raise your hand. We'll just, you know, we're all league people, so it's a, a friendly environment and we should just have a, a good time this morning. And um, as soon as we're finished, as soon as Gretchen has completed her remarks and taken all of our questions, then we'll just zip into our business meeting. And um, it shouldn't take too long, but we do have some important decisions to make. And then we'll all be out of here by noon because the gardens and lawns <laughs> are calling. And as soon as we're finished here, then I'm going to go fishing up north. So, because the fish are calling me and I have to respond. You might see Northern Lights too. They were out last night. Oh, well, that's cool. I'm all for that. So, um, I would like to, uh, first of all, welcome everybody. I see some people I haven't seen in a while. Um, Marsha, nice to see you. And so many from our board and Julie, maybe this is the first time I've met you on screen. Good to see you and meet you. So I would like to introduce to you as if she needed an introduction, All right, She's already famous in league, but she is our own Gretchen Sable and she is going to take us behind the scenes of the what I call the Upper Mississippi River region, but we were chatting before the meeting and Gretchen, she calls it Umrah. Now, I guess that's the the nickname for it, but it's um, an interleague organization um, dealing with the Mrs. Upper Mississippi. And she has been with the group from the beginning. So she knows all the secrets which ones may be safely shared, and which ones will be forever buried. Uh, as you know, Gretchen has a long career in environmental protection and environmental management. She's, uh, Gretchen, you were with the PCA, is that right? Yes. So, uh, you know, she is a, you know, an expert in her own right, in addition to being um, in the, you know, nonprofit league world now. Um, she's in addition to her work as a director on the UMRA, of course, she is president of her own league, um, uh, the ABC, which I, I like to call ABC Anoka Blaine Coon Rapids. As you'll remember, in our area in Ramsey County, we used to have the Roma Fa, and people said, Well, what the heck is Roma Fa? And that was Roseville, Maplewood, Falcon Heights. And so we got rid of that goofball nickname. And now we call ourselves officially Roseville, Maplewood, Falcon Heights, or Roseville area. Um, Gretchen, may I turn it over to you? Yes, you may. Thank you so much. OK, so I'm going to get this rolling here. And of course. My little share screen thing cover up my start my video thing. There we go. Okay. So, yeah, so I'm Gretchen Sable and I am the president of ABC. And so ABC also stands for um, 
Andover, Bethel, Champlin. We actually cover most of Anoka County. And so we just picked a general name rather than being Anoka County area because Champlin is in Hennepin County. So mm -hmm. here we are. <laughs> so anyhow, that's us. And I am talking about Ummer today, Upper Mississippi River Region, ILO. I'm coming to you today from scenic Chicago, which is also in the Mississippi River Basin. We're down here um, visiting cousins in Chicago on our way to Ohio to be with the grandkids for a bit for year end stuff in their school. So it's a a fun time, beautiful weather here in Chicago as well. And Chicago, of course, is the founding site of the league back in 20, 1920. So um, it's good to be here. You know, back when the suffrage movement was successful and women got the vote in 1920, yeah, 20, yeah, 1920, yeah. The, the thought was that a civic organization like League of Women Voters would help people with understanding issues and with um, understanding the basis for things and being informed electors. And so that was the purpose of League and that's what we're continuing to do today. The things I'm going to talk about, um, Karen hit some of them, what's an ILO? So it's some of them are very different than CMAL and so I'll talk a little bit about that. I've got some stuff on hydrology and nutrient science. That's a very untechnical way to say that because it's a very untechnical presentation. And, um, and then I'm also going to talk about how UMR works and what we do. So that's, uh, that's coming. So what is LWV UMRR? To start with, it's the League of Women Voters Upper Mississippi River Region Interleague Organization, which is just way too long. And so we write it as LWV UMRR and we say it as UMR. Um, the base of the League of Women Voters is comprised of local leagues, and so you can see those little boxes there. Those are all local leagues, mostly serving a given city or county. Local leagues work on local issues, run candidate forums, and register voters. State leagues tie the local leagues together, and they advocate on state issues. So you see here I've put in LWV, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, and other states. So they tie together the local leagues, and in LWV U.S., unites the whole thing into a national organization. In some cases, local leagues band together to address particular issues or needs of particular areas. And so that's an ILO, and that would look like that. So, you know, it's a group of leagues in a specific area, usually grouped by geography, and, um, and they're working on that. So we have, this said, this is an old slide, this is before Ummer was born. So at that time there was 20, there could be more now. And I circled CMAL. So you can see that there's Los Angeles area, Bay Area, um, Nassau County, Delaware, uh, National Capital Area. So they're, they're geographically oriented and they unite leagues in a certain area. Two interleague organizations are larger and incorporate leagues from multiple states. And so that's LWV Lake Michigan region and LWV Mississippi River region or us. Uh, the Lake Michigan Region League was founded in 1966. So they're much older than we are. They draw leagues from around Lake Michigan. And so they, again, are a four state organization and they um, serve, but you see in the green area there, but they also include a lot of Chicago. And I'll talk about the specific hydrology of Chicago here pretty soon. Um, LWV Upper Mississippi River region, our territory is the river basin from the headwaters in Northern Minnesota to Southern Illinois where the Ohio River comes in. And we focus on water quality and quantity. We were incorporated in 2015, so we're just babies in this thing. Uh, we right now have 64 member leagues and four state leagues. So we've got a lot of um, members, which is a good thing. Um, and members join us. And this is what our league looks like. So you can see that we incorporate state leagues and local leagues. And we report directly to LWV US. You see that little blue line there? So we are equal to the states in terms of the league hierarchy, right? Because we report directly to LWV US. And our purpose is to educate and advocate for the Upper Mississippi. Many common issues unite leagues in the Upper Mississippi. One of them is nutrients that have flow into the Gulf that create a dead zone that affects fisheries, shellfish and shrimp, and in poor water quality also. Um, they all, there's also issues with transportation of hazardous material on roadway by rail and water and, and pipelines, aquatic invasive species such as the invasive and silverhead carp, and then issues with commercial navigation, ecosystem restoration, water quality, 
flood risk management and other things. So there's a lot of things that we have in common up and down the river, even though we're very different from Bemidji to St. Louis. Um, the purpose in our bylaws, we're here to promote um, public understanding and active informed citizen participation in evidence-based decision-making as essential elements of responsible and responsive management of the natural resources of the upper Mississippi River region. This is from our bylaws, so it's kind of flowery language. We also are to promote resource conservation, science-based stewardship, and long-range planning. An efficient and economical government. Now, you recognize that. That's a, a key factor in uh, league positions. Efficient and economical government requiring competent personnel, the clear assignment of responsibilities, adequate financing, effective enforcement, coordination, and well-defined channels for citizen input. So basically, we're doing the same thing that League does every place else, but we're doing it around the river. Our board, um, we have five, six officer positions. Um, we have a chair, and the chair, we call him chair and not president. And they, we draw from our four states. So our chair is Mary Ellen Miller from Des Moines, Iowa. Our vice chair is Nancy Porter from Johnson County, Iowa, which is Iowa City. And then our past chair is Steve and Mary Placer. They served in a dual role, and they're from Madison, Wisconsin, LWV Dane County. And the way those three positions work, um, first you're the vice chair, then you move into the chair, and then you're the past chair. So, And you can only be the chair for two terms. It's a term-limited thing. So basically, if you sign on, the thought is that it's kind of an eight-year commitment. You're going to do your vice chair two terms as chair if you want to, and then stick on as past chair. And that way we keep um, knowledge within the board. Tam Prenisil from Dubuque is our um, secretary. Our treasurer is Catherine Franzik from LBV Wheaton down here in the Chicago area. And I'm the communications person, so I'm with ABC. Uh, each state then sends two representatives. They send a, a, rep, a full representative and an alternate. And those people are um, designated by their state league. So they're not voted on by us. They, the state sends them to us. And you can see there that um, in, uh, in Illinois, we have a couple, Lee and Paula. Paula is also on the board of the Lake Michigan ILO. So she kind of brings a lot of that knowledge in for us. Here in Minnesota, we have Kay Slama from Wilmer and Lonnie McCauley also from ABC. And then we have two women from La Crosse representing Wisconsin. So our board meets virtually with the first Monday of even numbered months. We usually start around 10 and go one to two hours. And then we have an educational session either in the afternoon or the evening. And if our educational guest can only meet in the morning, then we'll flip flop things. You know, we're pretty flexible. Um, so we talk about topics of concern in the basin. We highlight different areas within the ILO and we're open to the public. So that's um, and then we advertise them. You know, LWV is really in the right place at the right time right now. There's so much disinformation. There's so much uh, slanted news. You know, you listen to the news, and if you hear people using too many adjectives, disastrous, you know, the biggest, all those things warn you that that is not objective news. And the league provides objective news. So we do education and awareness. We advocate on issues based on positions and we form coalitions with partners. Um, with the League's century of experience lobbying and advocating, we see the chief benefit of UMR being the ability to amplify the voices of our citizens across dozens of congressional districts. And so we're um, moving into the realm of advocacy on the national scale. Our origin story, um, we started out following kind of the example of Lake Michigan region and also a league in Galena, Illinois, the LWV Joe Davies County League. And those of you that might have attended our annual meeting last year, um, they gave an excellent presentation on how a local league can be a real leader on water issues. And so I have a link in that, and hopefully whenever this gets posted, we'll be, make that link available to people. It's a great 20-minute video and something you could show at your, um, your local league meetings. So Lake Michigan region, you know, they've been around since 66 and they were working on lake issues and around, around the turn of, you know, 2000, EPA came up with a plan to address stormwater pollution that was going into the river, the lakes and the rivers and everything. 
And so it was a big national program and cities had to gear up and do things. And so the Lake Michigan League actually got a grant to do education around Lake Michigan on stormwater and how stormwater management is important. And they were doing this project and the people in Joe Davies County. So you see um, the woman here with the short dark hair in the top left picture. This is Bonnie Cox. We call her the mother of Ummer. Bonnie had been working with kids on water issues in Joe Davies County. This other lady here, this is Beth Baranski. She's the um, other mother. <laughs> and these two women really did so much in, in uh, the Galena area for water. And then when they saw the example of what Lake Michigan region was doing in a regional scale, they said, we need to have something like this. And so they came to the four states and they said, we want to form an ILO around the river. And so they got it started. And that's kind of how we got here. And the other thing that they learned in Joe Davies County is that by advocating on water issues, they really drew attention to league and they were, it was a great way to promote league and that kind of stuff. So, in, you know, people like to work on environment issues and league is a good place to do that because we are grassroots and because we advocate through science-based objective information. So again, we were incorporated in 2015. We focus on water quality and quantity. Um, we work base and wide. So we chose nutrient loss reduction, which is a weird kind of backward sounding thing. But what that means is that we want to have people keep nutrients where they belong, not in our water. So nutrients is like fertilizer and it doesn't belong in the water. It belongs where you're trying to grow the plants. Excess nutrients can cause al algae blooms that contaminate water and use up oxygen. And all four states that are working on nutrient loss strategies now. So we have a kind of a foundation. What is a watershed? Uh, this is my, I said, I was going to say some stuff about hydrology. So this is my some stuff about hydrology. A watershed is the area that catches rain and snow in a given area. And so the only way that water gets into a watershed is from the sky. Um, a watershed can be compared to a huge basin collecting all the precipitation that falls and carries it to a common outlet. Um, I will say uh, watersheds are not rectangular like this picture, but this picture actually does a pretty good job of showing a basin and how the water that falls comes down to the common point at the outlet of that river. So watersheds vary in size. And the Mississippi River watershed is the mother of all watersheds here on the North American continent. You see it starts up in the Canadian Rockies and the Colorado Rockies and comes down from the spine of the Appalachians and the uh, wetlands of Minnesota, and uh, it's a very large watershed. For Ummer's purposes, we are looking at the upper Mississippi. So we're the part of the Mississippi that doesn't include the Missouri, and it ends where the Ohio comes in. So you can see that our four states are the core of that area. And I want you to think about Chicago just for a minute here. In Chicago, which is here where I am, they, um, they get their water from Lake Michigan. It's very good water. And they were also dumping their waste into Lake Michigan. And they realized that probably wasn't the best idea. So they turned around the Chicago River. And the Chicago River actually flows now into the Mississippi, meaning that they, while they get their water from Lake Michigan, they are part of the Mississippi River watershed for their water. So that's we have a lot of leagues here in the Chicago area. I have a lot of friends here from league in Chicago now. So that's a good thing. Um, looking at nutrient pollution in the river, in the drainage basin, everybody recognizes the headwaters, right? Um, why was nutrient pollution a good issue for us as an ILO? Well, it transcends political boundaries and it affects the whole river basin. Uh, whether you're urban, rural, or suburban, there's stuff that you can do to work on this issue. So it's a good issue that would give everybody something to work on. It's an issue that isn't really as well understood by the general public as it could be. And each of our four states, like I said, is doing a strategy. So what causes the excess nutrients? Um, most of it comes from farm fields, largely through drain tiles runoff from crops. Um, manure should be on this because certainly all the animals that are raised and all their waste that goes onto the land um, creates nutrients that is lost. But we also, you know, there's urban residential runoff, there's industrial runoff and wastewater treatment plants. And so there's a lot of sources of nutrients that can be addressed. And nutrients are a problem because this nutrient rich water comes down the Mississippi 
and it like floats on top of the denser salt water on the Gulf. And when you have all those nutrients and all that sunlight and it's nice and warm, algae grows. And as the algae grows, it you know it gets green and slimy like on our lakes, but then the cells die. And as they decompose, that decomposition takes up oxygen. And then there's no oxygen left for the fish and the, the shellfish and that kind of thing. So it'd be called that the dead zone. And you can see the dead zone is quite large. Um, we all contribute to this. And let's see, in 2014, it was 5,000 square miles of dead zone. In 2018, it was the size of New Jersey. Our four states are major contributors. Um, the dead zone size varies by year. So the data that you can see there, that is the, um, the, the each year is different. So like 2022, it was so dry. So the dead zone was actually smaller last year. Uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus, where does it come from? Well, look at that. <laughs> we have all these states along the main stem of the river, which are the major sources of this pollution. And it just so happens that we're also where a lot of corn is grown and a lot of soybeans. And so when you think about corn and soybeans, what do you grow those for? You grow them for animals and ethanol, corn and animals mostly for soybeans. So those things are um, major crops that are grown in the area, and it's that row crop that creates 70% of the pollution, the row crop and the animals. So all these states have nutrient reduction strategies. They were all ad adopted in the early 2010s. Each one's a little different and focuses on different things because the situation on the ground is different, but also because the politics are different. And so, um, you know, each state has a strategy and they're following it and they have more or less levels of success. Uh, the goal was to reduce the dead zone to 5,000 acres, about eight square miles. And that was supposed to be done by 2015. Now that we're gonna go to 2035, um, the Inflation Reduction Act that passed last year um, did have a lot of funding for conservation programs. So we're hopeful that that will um, uh, move things ahead. But like I said, states must also take actions. and so. We just saw the Iowa legislature just um, hung up their, their uh, gavel and went home. And one of their actions that they did, they um, defunded all the monitoring of nutrient strategy, uh, nutrient locations. And so, you know, that state has made choices that's going to take it backwards. And, and that's what's going on. So anyhow, so UMR educates on nutrient solutions. So we share through different means. And I'll talk about these means in a minute what other people are doing and you know ways that um, there is success. We do education on bills in Congress. Um, the two that we're kind of working on now are the Farm Bill, which is a big one, and um, MRRRI, and everybody loves acronyms, the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative. And that's a bill that Betty McCollum is the chief author of. And so it's coming out of her and a lot of nonprofits in the area are working on that. We work with like-minded nonpartisan organizations, the Mississippi River Network, Clean Water for All is a, okay, so the Mississippi River Network is regional, um, based here in Chicago. The Clean Water for All group is a national organization, but the Farm Bill is a big issue for them, so that's why we're working with them. The Isaac Walton League has a Upper Mississippi River Initiative, and so we partner with them. Land Stewardship Project and the Minnesota Environmental Partnership are both Minnesota-centric organizations that we work with. So um, one of the things that we did, and um, some of you have been involved in this, before COVID, we were working with these landowner workshops. So um, 40 to 50% of the land that's farmed is not owned by those farmers, it's rented. And who owns that rental land? Well, it's um, women whose husbands died or kids that live in town. And so by putting on these rental um, workshops, and, and when it's in a rental situation, not to say that the farmers, well, it doesn't pay for them to do long-term care practices because they're not long-term owners. And the owners frequently feel funny talking to the renters about, well, you need to do it like this because especially if you're a older woman living in town talking to a young guy that's farming you don't even know what words to use. And so there's these workshops that we were helping um, land stewardship do and others. And so we were doing that. That was a, you know, we'd go to these things and talk to people or we would advertise them. So that was a thing that we did before COVID. 
Um, I don't know if you've heard of the watershed game. It was a, a game developed by the University of Minnesota Extension. And in this, you have a, 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 a synthetic watershed, you want to call it. They call it synthetic, but um, a make-believe watershed. And in your watershed, you can buy different practices and see how, if you put this practice on the land, how much does that reduce nutrient pollution? And the game is set up that you have a goal for the end of the watershed and then what can you do within your watershed and if you do a lot of this then will that take care of it no you'll have to do these other things so it's a really good learning tool and if anybody's interested in that we have trained facilitators that could help put it on for your league so just let us know um, it's a good way to um, put it on it's been done a lot for local officials and it ties a lot to stormwater um, work too so it's a good tool and we do that we, um, in 2018, we did a survey of leagues nationally to find out what other leagues are working on water issues. And you can see there those little um, league symbols on the map that shows you all the different leagues across the country that are working on water issues. And that was just the ones that answered the survey. Um, we advocate for the Forever Green program at the University of Minnesota. They're doing a lot of research into ways that farm fields, instead of going to just open dirt, which, you know, you lose a lot. Did you guys hear? Here in Illinois, there was a lot of cars that crashed into each other on the freeway because the fields had just been plowed. And when the strong wind came up, the dirt blocked the road and they couldn't see and they crashed and 13 people died. Well, that's bad. You know, it's bad for the cars, but it's also really bad because you're losing all that topsoil. And so if you can keep living cover on the soil, um, then you don't have that loss through wind or grown, uh, water reduction, water um, erosion. So anyhow, we uh, advocate for that. And we hope to inspire others. So we take on the challenge committed to expanding the knowledge of river basin residents about the watershed they live in. And we're hoping for a ripple effect haha, that should be the development of a robust stewardship ethic for the river. So we know our zip code, we know our area code, and we all should know our watershed as well. Water is indeed life. This is a picture I took in front of the Capitol a few years ago. Um, so some of the tools that we use, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, how are we doing on time? I will look at my chronometer here. Okay, yeah, we're doing good. Um, so the tools that we use, I, um, I'll share just a moment here. I was, um, I retired from working for the state in 2014. And around that time I had joined league and I was, or I, I belonged to league, but I had joined the lobby corps and I was working on, um, lobbying on state water issues at the Capitol. And at one of those meetings, somebody said, oh, they wrote to us from this group in Illinois and they want somebody to come to this meeting. They're trying to form an ILO. Anybody interested? And I looked around and nobody else raised their hand and I, oh, I'll do it. So I did. And I drove down to Galena and um, I continued to drive to Galena. And eventually it was, we decided we were ready to go. And when we were coming up with who was going to be an officer, oh, I'll be the treasurer. Somebody else is going to be the something else. And um, I sat on my hands and they said, well, President's what's left, so you got it. So I was the first president of the this ILO, or chair, first chair. Um, and I had a real hard time envisioning how on earth, you know, league, your local league at least has a place to be and a, you know, and, and a sense of purpose and things like that that comes from your geography. But when the geography was so big and everybody was so spread out, I didn't know how we were going to do that. So my first priority was to get a website and I had never run a website before and I didn't know boo about it, but um, we got, we work with Weebly and it's free or no, $200 a year. That's pretty cheap. And, um, and Weebly is way easier to use. So any of you that use the MyLO websites that league offers through uh, California, this is like, 15 times easier. It's very intuitive. It's drag and drop like Word. So while I didn't have any experience, I now have a website and I can make it work. And so this is our website and I'm actually proud of it. So, um, so we have a website and I write a blog. Now I used to work for the state and when you work for the state, you have your own thoughts and your own opinions and, but they have to be filtered up through many layers. 
And then it comes back to you and they say, you can say these things. But when I have a blog, I can say my own words. And so I love that. I just, I love being able to research a topic and then put up the information. So um, we have many, many blog posts. You can click on the categories on the right there if you want to see all the ones about um, Farm Bill, for example. And what I do is I pick things that are happening in the region and I write a blog post. Each one is 500 words, sometimes more. They're not all written by me. Um, and they always have lots of links so you can get background as you as you read them. And, and so they're meant to be a way to learn a lot about a single issue quickly. Uh, we have a membership page where we have a thing that people that want to just give us money can do that, and people do. And we also have a way that our member league can join online. They pay through PayPal, and that makes it easy for them um, to do that as well. So we have that on our membership page. Every year we have an annual meeting. Ours is going to be Monday. Um, and I remember we do an annual meeting page. We, I do a blog post for each of our bi-monthly educational meetings. And what I'll do is I'll write the blog post in a prospective way before it happens, saying these things are going to happen, here's the link, you know, whatever. We usually do webinars, so they have to register in advance. Um, so I'll do that, and then after, I go back and I post the video there so that people can find that same blog post and find the video and watch it. And then I go and I change all the um, verbs to past tense. So <laughs> we do a monthly newsletter. I do a monthly newsletter. I'm looking for an understudy. So if anybody wants to learn these things, you could be my understudy. Um, and I would be happy to foster somebody in that. Um, but anyhow, we do a monthly newsletter. We use MailChimp for our monthly newsletter. And what I do in the newsletter, um, it goes to um, all of our, we have almost a thousand people on our mailing list now. And these thousand people we've gained through, you know, if somebody's a speaker, they get on the mailing list. If a league asks us to add all their members. So all of you that are with local leagues, we could add all your members and you just explain to them that that's a benefit of their membership, that they get to get emails from us. So. Anyhow, so the, the newsletter comes out monthly, except in July, because I take July off from League. So, um, and then within each newsletter, uh, this is two columns it shows. So you'll scroll down in your newsletter, and I usually have something about whatever the next upcoming meeting is. In this case, it's our annual meeting. And then I include snippets, is what I called them this month. So you can see that there's three different snippets there, and each of these snippets leads to a blog post. So if you wanted to learn about food waste through the LWVUS Climate Interest Group, you can just click on that and the blog post, you'll go to that blog post and you can learn more. Um, and then we have um, right now the upper, the um, Isaac Walton League's Upper Mississippi River Initiative is doing presentations. They call their presentations Thinking Like a Watershed. So we've been running information on their partner presentations, we call them. Um, and, and that's a good way to advertise that. We're on Facebook. Um, I post to Facebook, well, probably daily, and I don't go searching for things, but you come across things because you've liked other leagues' pages, you see things that you follow, and I just share them. So you can see there, there was a story from, um, this was from the Park Rapids paper, Winona LaDuke talking about the need to um, work on uh, saving the water. This is one on soil conservation from Iowa someplace. So, you know, it's kind of a variety of things. This is flooding from up in the Anoka area. I think I got it, might have gotten that from Wes's website. Yeah. Um, and then oh, back when we started, back in 2015, the League of Women Voters of Minnesota nicely set us up a Google account. And so we use this email address um, as our primary uh, way of reaching out to people. And you can, and so, this gives me an official email address that I can use. So when I'm doing officially things, um, I can use this official email and people say, oh yeah, this is a league email and, and, and they recognize me in that kind of more official capacity. Um, and then with that, we got other kind of Google tools that we can use. So I frequently use Google Forms. Those of you that registered for our annual meeting will, would have fit, filled out a form like this and so we just ask for, you know, who are you and what's your address and that kind of stuff, your email address. So it's not a big deal, but by using Google Forms, 
Google Forms actually tabulates the results. And so I get a nice spreadsheet that shows me everybody's information. And then I can create my own mailing list from this and reach out to people. And um, so that's a, a wonderful tool and I really appreciate that. And then we also through Google have a YouTube channel and all of our videos go onto our YouTube channel as a place right? I store them here on the YouTube channel and then I link them through those blog posts. So working together all these um, uh, virtual things have given us a way that we have a presence. And that was what I wanted. I wanted a way to have a presence. I wanted to have something to point to. So what is, um, oh yeah, well here, look at our website. You know, I can put you on the mailing list to get the, the newsletter. And by having those kinds of tools, it really helped people to get a, a handle on who we are and what we are and how to connect with us and how to see our programs and how to find past programs and that kind of stuff. So that's there. Um, we have an action committee and our action committee is members of the board and um, a few other people. And we meet monthly. We monitor legislative activity in the states. And if we are also, and we also do things with the national legislation. Um, Kay Slama is our action committee chair. And Kay wanted to have a fast way to reach people. So um, she sends everybody a text. She says, hey, we have a sign on letter we need to respond to in 24 hours. And so she sends a text and you have to go back to your email then and find that and say if you approve or deny that request. Um, because of the Minnesota legislature this year, we have been doing sign on letters like crazy for Minnesota um, and we do occasional action alerts. So that's our action committee. Um, yeah, so that's it. You know, we, uh, we work on the river, we work on river issues. Um, back when we first started, we traveled. And so we would meet in different states each two months. And I got to know the watershed really well through that traveling. This is St. Paul. Um, this was the uh, Friends of the Mississippi had their event where you paddle down the river. So that's their people paddling. But um, so anyhow, so that was, that's it. That is the presentation and I will unshare here and we can chat. Gretchen. Uh, I got to sit in on a video that Amr did earlier this month, uh, Thinking Like a Watershed. I noticed as you were going through your slides, you actually have like a series of uh, video type of uh, presentation things going on. Can you just tell a little bit if, I think you're still in the middle of a series or something on that. Can you talk a little bit about what that uh, is focusing on? So that's the um, Isaac Walton group. They're doing their thinking like a watershed series. They actually have a lot of money and paid staff, so they do it monthly, <laughs> which I wouldn't have the ability to do. But um, they uh, they have a variety of speakers. What was their What was the one you saw, Wes? They, they uh, it was uh, it was Aaron Spry, I think. It oh, was yeah. uh, the yeah. it literally was called thinking like a watershed, but she was really focused on. Uh, the the two main ones coming out of Chicago and then coming down from St. Paul. Yeah, yeah. So thinking like a watershed is what they call that series, and uh, um, there is actually a plethora of organizations called Upper Mississippi River Region. So the UMBRA is the Upper Sip, Upper Mississippi River Basin. Basin Association, which was formed by state governments, I think, and they send delegates, and they work together on a lot of navigation issues and things related to transportation, but they're starting to look at the issues of water quantity. And I didn't talk about that, but you know, we're thinking about, I don't know if people are following what's going on in Elko Newmarket right now. Um, uh, what, what company was it? Some company wants to come and put a water bottling plant there. And Niagara. Niagara, it's gonna be bottled water in, in bottles, just like we all buy all the time, right? And um, and because they can't get water appropriation permits a lot of time, they, what they found is they'll go to a city and that they buy city water. So they're basically sticking city water into the bottles that we're buying. And it's, it's good tested water and there's no, no problem with it, but it really increases the water use from that place. And then it sends that water out of the area. So water, 
leaves of the watershed not just flowing out but through sails through waters like that um, other ways that water leaves is in beer um, pop food products you know we do a lot of agricultural food processing here and so all that water that goes into growing the crop canning the crop you know that water is leaving our watershed um, when we raise hogs and turkeys you know they take water and water leaves that way so there's a lot of water use that leaves the area and how how do you account for that you know in a natural setting all that water would have stayed in the watershed and flowed down the river um, and now it's it's leaving in trucks so and there's also you know people that want to fill up trains here fill up trains of water and haul it off to the southwest or build pipelines to the southwest and so those are different kinds of issues and and we're just starting to think about those things and to decide how we might work on that um, one of the ideas was to have a compact like the great lakes has so the great lake compact says you can't take water out of the great lakes to a different watershed and so they basically said don't pipelines although they're still going out in bottles and all that other kinds of stuff so um, so anyhow, so yes, Wes, <laughs> the, the answer to your question was that is a, one of our partner organizations that's doing those monthly talks. And they're all called Thinking Like a Watershed. Is that Gretchen? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so I was going to ask you, um, what, what, what size budget do you have at? at umra how how big are you financially well we're not big we have okay. um, you know back when we traveled to meetings and we had facility costs and things like that it was a lot more expensive now we just have our website fees and um well we're having actually an in-person board retreat this year so that'll be some expense okay it, you know it's less than ten thousand dollars and we um our only income is donations, and then each each league, each of our member leagues, gives us twenty five dollars a year, and so with we're well within that budget, and um, yeah, it all works. You know, Facebook's free, um, Mailchimp is free, the website's relatively cheap. You have to pay for your domain name and things, so it's probably six hundred dollars or less a year. And then we, we do um, tabling at different events as well. I didn't put that down, but um, you know we're gonna be at the state convention this year here in Minnesota with a table. And, uh, and we actually have two events. I should have talked about that. Dang it, thank you, Karen. Uh, we have coming up the state convention in June and Friday afternoon, we're gonna be down on the river, on the Minnesota River. And we're going to be handing out uh, Jerry Nelson's For Love of a River book. Her husband Darby wrote that. It's an excellent book about the Minnesota River and how it's changed over the decades. And we'll be handing out seed packets and doing education on different federal bills. So stop down there if you're coming to New Ulm. And then on a Saturday morning with breakfast, we'll be Jerry's going to talk about the book. And so we'll have um, a couple different events at that. So we do that kind of thing. We have displays that we take to those. So we've paid money to have pull up displays and brochures and, and we get the word out that way. So our budget isn't great, but it's certainly sufficient. Say, say Gretchen, of all the local leagues who are, exist in the uh, area of UMRA, how, how many local leagues are um, is there a percentage of how many have joined? Um, it's kind of funny in a way. In Iowa, we have 100% of their leagues, but they only have like 18 leagues in the state. So, <laughs> so we have 100% in Iowa, but it's a smaller number. We have um, probably 30% to 50% here in Minnesota. It's probably up right now. And I'm hoping that this event that we do in New Ulm will raise our awareness. Um, Sometimes people fall off because they get a new treasure and we don't know who to write to and the new treasure doesn't know about us and can't find us. So there's some that leave intentionally and some that leave unintentionally. Um, within Wisconsin, you know, there's a lot of leagues that aren't part of our watershed over on the eastern side of the state. And so I think that we're pretty good within our watershed here in Wisconsin. And in Illinois, we really need to add leagues. We have a lot of members in the Chicago area, but nobody further south. So we need to work on that. So no end to work, right? 
Yeah, I suppose some leagues they when they understand the name of Umrah, they say, "Well, we're not, we don't uh, our area is not on the Mississippi. This isn't for us." But it's really the watershed. So yeah, yeah. You know, I really would like to do some events here in the um, Illinois area, and we've just recently found an organization here, the Illinois Rivers Association. And we're going to try to do some partnership with them and, and maybe get more awareness going through them. So, other questions? Uh, yeah, are there other questions? I mean, I, the amount of information, Gretchen, that you have provided is almost um, overwhelming. Oh, all right. So, and I, I misspoke. I called it Umra. No, Umr. Umr. Hummer, Hummer without the H, you know, okay. I got to have a mnemonic here. Yeah. But so, um, I will say, you know, I, I know that I think that CMAL needs to kind of up your game on electronic media. And so <laughs> I will volunteer if somebody wants to learn about it. They could, I would spend time with people that want to learn how to do a website or want to learn MailChimp. I would be happy to work with anybody to do those things. So, um, the advantage to MailChimp over regular email is that it maintains the, the list for you. People can subscribe and unsubscribe, and it's a more professional look to the emails. So I still use our regular email to talk to our members, but I have this list of almost a thousand people who signed up to get the glitzier MailChimp <laughs> newsletter. And so, you know, I would be happy to do that work with you guys. Well, I appreciate the advice and also your willingness to help. And um, we'll, we'll certainly have to look into that. So I thank you for the offer and the advice. And I appreciate, you know, when you're trying to, as you said at the beginning, how, how do you create an organization where the individual people are in several states? And uh, that's a, a daunting task but you know technology is has helped and you you are now an expert yeah no i just so, know the things i do <laughs> so gretchen gretchen uh kind of a and this actually stays within not so much what ummer is but what we were talking from karen's question just a few minutes ago here um if if there are any of the folks on the call today within our cmal call who are are pretty confident that their own local league is not currently part of Ummer. I'm assuming all it really takes is at a upcoming meeting that they they put forward a, a, a motion and pass a resolution that they are going to join Ummer and then their treasurer needs to send a $25 check to, to Ummer for membership. Is that basically what's in, involved? So it's, it's and what we can do is when we put out our next publication, uh, probably not under MailChimp, I'm sorry, but we will maybe try to promote, um, we can promote membership in the CMAL area for those local leagues who haven't yet, you know, it doesn't count everybody in the state, but we've got quite a group locally here. So thank you. Thanks for mentioning that, Wes. Anybody else? Uh, any more questions? Well, I thank you immensely, Gretchen. I I was really pretty ignorant, so I have to admit.